Um, so my name is JT. Uh, I'm one of the developers, as Jason said, of FreeNAS and TrueNAS. I work for IX Systems. I'm also a developer of TrueOS. Um, I used to be a Linux developer, but I'm now working on TrueOS. So TrueOS is a desktop Linux <coughs> operating system that's based on FreeBSD. Um, it originally was called PCBSD. Some of you may have heard that. It was PCBSD for over 10 years. Um, but after 10 years, uh, the lead developer, Chris Moore, decided that he wanted to change some things up. Um, it wasn't that he was bored, he just wanted to go in a new direction with it. So PCBSD evolved into what is now TrueOS. Um, so one of the questions that people always get when they say, well, why did you change the name? Um, for one of the stupidest reasons, but actually a reason we kept hearing all the time, is the fact of the name, PCBSD. Um, people refer to it as alphabet soup. People were like, well, what, what, is that, what does that mean? Um, a lot of Linux people as well were actually put off by the fact that BSD was in the name and just would instantly write it off from that point um, based on things that they had heard about. That's about to fall. There you go. Because they got some emails from Theo Durant. They, they heard there's this, there's this mean guy in the BSD community called Theo um, who's basically our version of Linus, so I don't know what the big deal is. Yeah. They're both opinionated. Um, no, he's more opinionated. We could debate that, but we're not going to. So anyway, we, uh, we decided to, to rename to TrueOS. Part of the reason for that was IX Systems already had um, TrueNAS as part of a brand that they had. Um, so we just decided to roll with that. Um, and again, PC doesn't reflect the nature of the project now. Um, TrueOS, there's a desktop variant and there's a server variant. And we actually also have a Raspberry Pi variant as well, um, which I will be touching on later. <coughs> The other main reason was that so much has changed internally from what PCBSD used to be to what TrueOS is that it just seemed like if we were going to rename, now was the time to do it. Um, historically, PCBSD followed the release track of FreeBSD. FreeBSD basically has several tracks. The best way I can explain it is kind of like the different versions of Debian. You have a very, very stable version, then you have SID and all the other versions. So release for FreeBSD is this is never going to break. Um, and that is what PCBSD followed. When FreeBSD would put out version 9, PCBSD, or when FreeBSD would put out version 9, PCBSD 9 would be based on that and would be stable. Um, in late 2015, we decided to follow the current track, which is more of the experimental, more of the edge. It's where the updates are actually going in and being tested. Um, and then when we shifted over to TrueOS last summer, we decided let's just go and full current. We are always pushing the latest packages, um, and we're usually about two to three days behind when a change hits to when we're actually shipping it out. So that would be like a stretch. Yes, I'm not a Debian guy, so. All right. Okay. <laughs> Um, so in a way where we follow, for those that are familiar with Arch, it's pretty much an Arch design as far as when changes happen, they're shipped as fast as possible. Um, for those that don't know what a rolling release model is, it's basically as soon as changes happen upstream, they are pulled downstream and then they are run with. Um, for us in TrueOS, this allows us more modern hardware support in a more timely fashion. One of the things that has been historically true with FreeBSD is because the standpoint has been in absolute stability, you don't get the newest hardware drivers right away. Because the point is, if you install it, it's going to work, there's never going to be any questions, and it's never going to crash. Well, obviously, new hardware, that's not the way it always works. So going with the FreeBSD current, as soon as the new hardware drivers are shipped, even if they're a little buggy, we have them and we're using them. This allows us and our users access to more of the cutting edge features that are just being developed. And it fills an important usability gap for current as binary users. 90% of the people that run FreeBSD current are the actual developers themselves, and they're always compiling from source. So there was a gap of no one was actually testing once these things are compiled how they're actually running, because people are just constantly rebuilding their system all the time. Um, and the other reason we decided to go with this is because of using ZFS, we mitigate all the problems of rapid updating when breakage occurs. Um, and I'll get into this later with boot environments. Right now, I guess. So boot environments, does anybody not know what ZFS is? 
Okay. ZFS as a file system was designed to be the file system we need 30 years from now. Um, it is a self-healing block storage file system with checksums for every change that happens. Um, changes are not overwritten, so all your old, for instance, when you edit a file, as things change, the new changes are written into a new block with a new hash, but the metadata is still there to go back to the old file if you need to. So with boot environments, this is pretty much what we're doing, is we set a flag in the file system of these files are in this boot environment. So when an update occurs, we can create a new boot environment, all the updates go into that, and then when you reboot your system, you're into the new boot environment. If something goes sideways, you can simply reboot into the old boot environment, and you're right back to where you were before the update took place. It's like having a file system that has Git as part of it? Yeah, basically. <laughs> That's a good way to look at it. That's yeah. called get a file system. So. It's um, yeah. yeah. How, uh, long does it, how long does it retain the changes? Forever. Until you tell it not to. Until you go in and actually manually delete stuff out, which you have to do from outside of the working environment. Um, the, the premise of it was you never want to lose your data. Mm -hmm. So because of that, there is virtually no way to actually lose your data. Um, there has been talk about how to actually enable things like secure file deletion into the file system, but the main developers of the file system really don't want to do that because their, their underlying motto is data should never go away. Wouldn't that create a lot of overhead though? Yes and no. Um, because it's, it's writing at a block level instead of a file level, if you go in you have a, a document, let's say a big text file or whatever, and you go in and change three words. It's not writing the whole file again. It's simply writing the changes that occurred. So because of that, the file system is not growing at the rate that you would expect it to grow because you're actually only changes, saving the changes to the file as it previously was. Um, what size block does it use? How, whatever you said. I think the smallest is 4K. And then it goes up to there to I think sixty four meg blocks if you want. Well, what size? What size base drive? Whatever. Um, your data sets as user home are not included in any boot environments. So, if you do an update, you have all of your personal files that go along with you. All your configuration, all that stuff is going to stay with you between boot environments. Um, this also allows you to run multiple versions of the operating system on the same drive too. So if you want to have FreeBSD, TrueOS, um, I guess you could technically run Dragonfly as well, or any of the other BSDs, if you install them into another boot environment, they will exist side by side on the same disk without ever having to worry about partitioning your drive. Um, and of course your user directory is going to be across all of this. Um, this allows people to try before they buy, so to speak, of new versions and updates. They can try it if something goes wrong. They can just simply roll back to their prior boot environment until we fix the problem, and then they can roll forward again. So in some ways we have diverged from FreeBSD, and I'll go over those, but in other ways we have actually moved back. Since we were in the past running on release only, um, we never really gave any feedback to the FreeBSD project because we were taking all of their very hard work and just utilizing it and weren't really offering much back in return. Um, but now that we're running on current, we're able to give a lot of feedback on the latest changes that are going into the operating system. Uh, we've moved to use the BSD bootloader instead of Grub. We historically did use Grub, but we decided to go with the BSD bootloader, um, which FreeBSD had been using for about two to three years. Um, again, tracking current allows us to give better feedback to the developers who are actually running on current. Um, and TrueOS has become sort of a test branch for FreeBSD. Developers that want to do new stuff, and they're actually testing it on their daily systems with TrueOS running. Um, and I'll go into that in one of the things. One of the main issues that this is being used is in the graphics stack. Um, FreeBSD has the Linux kernel as a library, so anytime we need to do system calls or anything like that, we just have a library that we can refer to, um, and we're bringing in all the Linux graphics drivers as well. I think right now we're up to 4.9, but I'm not entirely sure. Um, so again, testing branch. Uh, we have brought in uh, LibreSSL instead of OpenSSL. Um, LibreSSL comes from the OpenBSD group. 
Um, they're really good at cutting out old cruft and trying to make a small security footprint. Um, that's also why we default to OpenNTP. And again, because we're using ZFS and boot environments, we don't have to worry about ABI breakages between different versions and different libraries because if something does happen, we can just simply roll back to the prior boot environment or the prior package and it'll work again. Um, yes, we are utilizing the uh, Linux 4.9 right now. Um, does do you, Jason, do you know if 4.10 or 4.11 has anything new in it? I KB don't Lake. think it does. Okay, KB Lake. Got it. Okay. Uh, we have removed Clang and LLVM. FreeBSD uses Clang and LLVM instead of GCC for the compiler and the linker. Uh, we have removed that from base, but it is still available. One of the reasons we did that is a lot of users don't really need a compiler, and it's a whole the whole tool chain is about an extra gigabyte. And it was nice to save that on all the downloads from people having to download it, but then install it and never use it. Um, it's, of course, easily installable with a single command, but when most users don't need it, we're just saving space. We are, however, forging into new territories away from FreeBSD. One of those is the Luminic desktop, which I will have a whole section on later. Um, PCBSD tried to be as agnostic as possible towards different desktop environments. Um, the install ISO for PCBSD, I think, included a dozen or so different desktops, which you could install when you installed your system. The problem is that the FreeBSD porting teams are kind of like Sisyphus and that they're constantly pushing that boulder up the hill because as things change on the Linux side, then we have to take those changes and then make them work for FreeBSD. Because of this, there are some desktops that support for is way behind. Uh, what is KDE at right now? Five, nine? Um, Do you know? Five, nine. Okay, so KDE is at five, nine. In FreeBSD, KDE is at 414. Um, five still hasn't gotten ported over. They, I think at this point, they've almost got Plasma done, but nothing else is done. Yeah, there's a lot um, in KDE5. Yeah. So because of this, we decided, okay, we need to roll a desktop specifically for the BSDs so that we're not constantly having to fight with when the Linux side changes something and it completely breaks everything on our system and how to figure out to make it work again. Um, it also allows us to integrate directly some of the features that the BSDs have with ZFS support, boot environment, so on and so forth. One of the other things that we've gone ahead and done is we've created a new login manager. Um, similar problem whether we're using KDM, GDM, LightDM, it was the same problem. Linux, they would change things because of X on their side and then it would break everything on our side. Um, and some people kind of got tired of constantly fighting the against the stream battle. So we just went ahead and wrote our own. Um, we also integrate uh, Jelly Encryption and the PEFS, which is the personal encryption files system for your home directory so that you can actually, I don't, I'm not gonna yank that one out, but you can actually have your home directory on a USB stick. So when you install your system and you create your user, you can stick a USB stick in and choose, I want my home directory to be on this and it's encrypted. So then you can take that to any other TrueOS system you have, plug it in, exchange a key, and then log into your system with all your files on a USB. Um, that's not something that is obviously capable in any of the Linux uh, managers. Because we were writing our own, we're like, hey, this is something we've had a few requests for, let's just go ahead and roll it right in. And it also allows for the True Pico, TrueOS Pico features, which I will touch on later, and that's the Raspberry Pi variant. We also have created SysADM, which is a Qt WebSocket API for controlling your system. Um, and we have clients for TrueOS, Windows, Mac, Linux, and I might be working on an Android version, I don't know. The best way to describe it is, for those of you that are familiar with GNOME or KDE, when you have your system setting program that allows you to change and tweak all your settings, or in SUSE, I guess it's YAST, um, we have a platform agnostic utility that allows you to do that from any other system. So I can have a Windows box and actually administrate any TrueOS desktops or TrueOS servers that I have and I'm running. Um, you just have to do a couple key exchanges ahead of time and then you're good to go. You said Qt REST, isn't Qt a front-end framework? The application is written in Qt. Okay. It uses WebSockets and REST API. Yeah. Okay. Maybe you know I, what it's I got the order out of it. You know. Do you know what it's written in? The, um, like, the REST API? It's written in Qt. Yeah. 
Qt is not specifically a GUI framework. It's best known for that, but it has a completely lower subset you can, that can produce very good you actual can embed systems okay. with Qt on them and no OS. And no graphics. <coughs> Uh, I've only, well, I've only ever seen it for the front end system, so I'm nope, sure there's different on the back end. But I'm, saying it, I'm just yeah. saying it's entirely not required. Uh, and OpenRC, that's the other big change we've done. Um, historically, we used uh, SysVNet, which works. It works well. It's a little long in the tooth, and there's a lot of really stretching to reach behind your back to hit that one point when you need in some shell scripts and some init things. So we were looking for another uh, init system. Obviously, systemd is not available on FreeBSD or any of the BSDs. And the BSDs are very, very opinionated about systemd. Um, and in our searching, we found, of course, we knew of OpenRC, but once we actually started looking into it, we realized that it actually originated from the BSDs. It was written by a NetBSD developer. Um, and then he just kind of got bored with it and didn't do anything. And then Gen2 kind of went hog wild with it and did a whole bunch of development. So we've pulled that all back in and committing upstream for it. Um, it doesn't require us to reinvent the wheel because the wheel has already been reinvented several times. We can just take the wheel that we like. Our old boot time was about 60 seconds. Now it's down to about 20. So again, parallelization of the init system is very nice. So things we're looking at doing in the future. Uh, TrueOS Pico is the one I mentioned. Uh, it is not. I don't know if there are release images available right now. Um, it's all internal, but I don't know. Chris may have put out some images. It is an ARM version of TrueOS specifically designed to operate as a thin client on a Raspberry Pi or a BeagleBone or whatever else you have. Um, why? Because we all had Raspberry Pis. They were sitting around. We were staring at them, and they were just collecting dust. And we all were joking one day of, we need to be able to figure out how to do something with those. Um, and so we came up with this idea. It's two parts. It's a Pico server and an ARM image. So the server is what you would run on your desktop, or if you have a server in your house, you can run it on a server. Um, and then, of course, the ARM image is what you're actually booting on the Pi. Uh, the server operates as the MDNS ad advertiser, which the client on your uh, ARM device searches for. They find it, they do some key exchange, and then an X11 forwarding session is started. Um, and it's right there. It's simple to set up. You just do your normal thing to set up an image on a Raspberry Pi. You install one package on your TrueOS desktop, and then you start it. So why does it require a server? The reason why is because it's actually not running on the Pi. Okay. The Pi is simply the what you're connecting your mouse and keyboard and monitor to. Everything else is happening on the actual main system. Would it be possible to actually so make Pi... the entire, like a Raspbian, but free BSD? So is that like similar to PXC booting? No. So the system the on the on the Pi, all it is doing is booting up and making a WebSocket connection. Mm -hmm. Okay. At that point, everything else is running on the host system. Yeah. And they're just forwarding the X session to the Pi, which is then just putting it on the screen. Yeah. That's all it's doing. So your OS is not there is an OS running on the Pi, yeah. but all it is doing is an interface to the system that is running the Pico server. Mm -hmm. um, so, it's for instance, client. yeah, it's a thing. You, you using the Raspberry Pi as an X terminal? Yes. Yeah, yeah I, I get that. But what I'm saying is, could you make an entire OS for like standalone Raspberry Pi? Of course you could. Yeah, we could. Okay. It, well, so how many years do you want to spend? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Here was here was the main reason why Chris decided to go this route. He has five kids. Okay. It's a whole lot easier for him to go, I have five pies here, plug them into your thing, and go. Anytime he wants to do anything, he sits down at his computer to configure it. Yeah. All their file storage is on his computer. Uh -huh. um, if they want to do Minecraft or whatever, which I think is one of the main things that they do, he can just stick a beefier graphics card in his system, and he's done. Um, so you don't have to worry about trying to run ZFS on a Pi for data integrity because it's going to run on your main system that has enough power to run ZFS. Okay. Um, or, for instance, if you're running this on a FreeNAS unit and you've loaded the server on your FreeNAS unit, it, it's just stored on the NAS. Uh -huh. um, also, that means there's one point to upgrade because he upgrades his system and everything gets upgraded that they're going to use. Um, the other main thing that I mentioned that we were doing is the Lumen Desktop. Um, the Lumina Desktop is obviously a desktop environment. It is not a window manager yet. We are using Fluxbox for the actual window management, which we absolutely detest, and that's why I'm borrowing Nate's 
laptop right now because Fluxbox really has issues with multi-monitor sometimes. Um, the window manager will probably be finished in the next couple months, uh, but we've run into some roadblocks that we're trying to work around. The entire desktop is based around the Qt5 uh, framework and toolkit. Uh, like you had mentioned, you're used to front ends being done with, GUI, with Qt. Um, Lumina does not need anything in particular on the system. It is built to be as independent as possible from whatever OS it's on. Um, BSD3 clause, it's extremely lightweight. The entire install size is about 50 meg. Its memory footprint when running is about 100 meg, and it starts in about five seconds. Um, it is built to be as portable as possible. It is running on all the BSDs. It was ported to Slackware. I did that back in 2014, I think. It's since made it to Arch, Debian, Fedora, Ubuntu, you name it, it's there. Um, the depends on Linux is pretty much X Screensaver, QT, and then maybe one or two other libraries. Um, we try to make it as small as possible so that it doesn't need much. Uh, it avoids specific OS technologies, so even though it was developed on FreeBSD and for FreeBSD, if you don't have ZFS, it doesn't care. Now, if you do have ZFS and boot environments, it will take advantage of that, but it's not required. Um, in the file manager, we actually have a slide bar, so whenever you're in a directory, if you have different snapshots because you've been using your system later, you can actually drag the slide bar back and see all the files, if you've deleted files or you're not uh -huh. using files, that are st you have in a previous snapshot that are there. So you can just scroll back and go, oh, there's the one I want, boom. And as you scroll back, you're also getting the older versions of the files that are there. So if you have a presentation that you edited, and then a week later you realize, oh crap, I needed some stuff that I had taken out of the presentation, you go into your file manager, you scroll back, oh, there's the older version, let me load it, and there's all the stuff you just took out. Uh, but again, if you don't have uh, ZFS, that's fine. Um, I actually haven't tested to see if that works with ZFS on Linux, but I should do that. Uh, so application agnostic. Lumina does not care about what applications you run. One of the big things that was always an annoyance to me with desktops like GNOME is GNOME expects you to run the GNOME blessed application. And if you don't run the application that GNOME has blessed, you're going to run into headaches. Because GNOME tries to, and I understand why they're doing it, integrate everything as much as possible. The problem with that is some things are counterintuitive. For instance, if you use their IRC client, uh, Pivity, I think is what it's called, if you want to add a server to the IRC client, well, you don't actually do that in the IRC client. You have to go into the user manager and then go into network settings to then be able to add a server to the IRC program. Um, that kind of stuff really annoyed us, so we decided it's your system. You can install and use whatever applications you want. That's up to you. Um, it will recognize any XDG registered application, and the system will never assume, oh, this is a text file. You want to open that in this application. Anytime you open an application that you have not opened before, it will prompt you to choose what you want to load. And at that point, it will continue to use that program, but it does not ultimately set defaults um, initially for what it should be launching in. If you're migrating from one, an older install to a newer install, can you copy those defaults over? Yes. Okay. Um, the system, Lumina is broken down into three parts. The core, which is actually the desktop itself. The open, Lumina Open Utility, which is what actually registers all the XDG stuff for what application should uh, run what. Um, that is all you need to actually run Lumina. Everything else from that point on is optional. Um, so the core utilities that we do recommend is Lumina Config, which is so you can change the different ways of how your desktop looks, whether or not you have panels, whether or not um, you have different user buttons on your desktop. Uh, but if you don't want to, you don't have to run it. Uh, Lumina Search, which is just simple search utility that we're about to redo, uh, but that's just for if you want to launch an application, you can actually search your system if there is no XDG recognition. You can search it for what application will run that um, that file. Uh, Lumina Xconfig is just basically our monitor, our monitor configuration program. The desktop utilities are completely optional. You don't have to use them at all. You can install whatever else you want. Um, and file information, the file manager, screenshot, text editor, media player, archiver, calculator. Just the general things that every desktop or 
window manager desktop environment ships with. Originally, we didn't have those at all other than the file manager. But over time, people were like, hey, I don't want to have to install all of KDE just to get a file manager. Or I don't want to install all of GNOME just to get a file manager, but I want something that's a little more fully featured than just running Thanar or PC Manfan or whatever. So over time, we've developed those one at a time as people have asked for them and added them in. But you don't have to use them at all. They're there. So future plans for the operating system. Window Manager was one I already mentioned. Uh, replacing X Screensaver is another. Uh, there are things we really don't like about X Screensaver. Also the developer, he's kind of a jerk. Um, for those of you that don't know, he actually got really pissed off. I believe it was the Debian project because he had hard-coded in warnings that you should not be using uh, a certain older version, which of course is in the older stable versions of Debian because that's what they do. They want things to be really stable. And so they submitted a request to have basically this alert of you shouldn't be using this version taken out of the application. Um, his response was no, it's my application, I wanna do what I want. And when somebody pointed out, well, technically it is open source, so we can just fork it and just take out that one line and that's all we need to do. And then he told the Debian team they could go F themselves, which isn't really the way open source is supposed to work. Uh, Wasn't he also the one that said you can't change the logo on the lock screen? Like when you go to log back in? Yeah, I think you yeah. can't change the logo because that's part of the application. Um, and there were some other things that we didn't like about uh, X Screensaver as far as security uh, purposes, which is why point number one is to ensure a proper security chain. Because if you actually SSH into the box and kill the X Screensaver application, you're back in the desktop, um, which is not a good thing. The The with your login manager, your desktop environment, your window manager, and your screensaver all being separate things that all kind of want, have their own thing that they want to grab, it introduced a whole lot of different, I don't want to say threat vectors, but exploit vectors that could be used, and just things where you would have problems of race conditions where a certain message is going across the system bus and you have two different applications that both want to grab it and do something with it. Um, so then code had to be put in into the different applications to, okay, if this gets this, take it. If it doesn't, then I'll take it. So we want to take all that out, um, or that whole, eliminate that whole problem, and just integrate the window manager, the desktop, and the screensaver all into one binary. A um, couple months, hopefully it'll be done, but we're still working on it right now. Um, for us, this also means we will have proper handling of keyboard shortcuts and the possibility of mouse gestures. Fluxbox is not too good on that. Uh, we initially went with Fluxbox because we wanted to create a desktop and we didn't want to have to reinvent the entire car initially. We just wanted to do it a piece at a time. The problem with Fluxbox is the developer does not care about Fluxbox anymore. We have sent patches in for about three years and I think he's merged three of them. Um, at one point he sent an email to Ken Moore, one of the lead developer of Lumina, which basically said, can you stop sending patches in? because he just didn't want to work on it anymore. Um, that was kind of the final kicker for Ken deciding, okay, I need to actually redo and, and integrate a, file or a window manager from the get-go. Um, another thing that we're considering doing is actually evolving the file manager away from just being a standalone utility that you interface with to actually a daemonized process. Um, we're still kind of working out how we want that to work uh, but the, the concept is that you're no longer tied to the UI front end of a file manager actually do any file system actions at all. Um, this would also mean that paralyzing workloads as far as copies and stuff aren't bound by the UI application, uh, which is one of the main things that we've run into, not just with our own file manager, but with other file managers as well is one process that's running, or sub-process of the file manager will end up slowing down everything else. So, that's another thing we want to avoid. You guys said you use uh, Thuna right now, or what's this? No, right now we ship with our own file manager. Okay. Um, it's it's kind of minimal at this point, outside of all the fancy ZFS and boot environment stuff that we've added in, um, but we want to kind of redo it all from scratch. Okay. But that's on the schedule after we do the window manager. Because that right now is our main priority. Because uh, we have gotten sufficiently sick of Fluxbox. Um, it just, it's, yeah. 
it's annoying. So sources, if you're interested, the website, of course, forum and all that stuff is right there. Um, does anyone have any particular questions? Is wireless great? Not great. Um, it, well, it depends on what you have. Okay. Um, I have the Intel 7620. Okay. And it works fine. Okay. I had the 8620, and it was kind of hit or miss. Um, the developer who's doing all the wireless work, uh, Adrian Chad, he's one of the OpenBSD developers. So he has been. OpenBSD is one of the leads on a lot of the wireless yeah. stuff. They feed Linux. Not the other uh, way okay. um, it's actually funny. At, in November, I was out at MeetBSD at Ber in Berkeley, and he had a whole bag of wireless cards. <laughs> and he would sit down, and he had a, um, it's a PC card um, that he would slide in, and then it would have the interface so he could then actually clip the card <laughs> in. Um, and yeah, he would just randomly go through and pull different cards out as he was working on different code to say, okay, does it work on this one? Yep. Okay, disconnect, plug the next one in. Also, so, yep. Some really bizarre things there because the BSD people will go absolutely hysterical over the BSD license. The GPL is evil, and they don't want to have anything to do with it. However, on the wireless side, the Linux people are perfectly happy to take binary firmware for Wi-Fi devices and download it into your Wi-Fi card and build a driver to work over top of it. The BSD people have to reverse engineer the wireless device and put their own firmware in. That's because we won't sue the Linux people, but the Linux people will sue us. Uh, it's not even just about the Linux people. It's, it, the the OpenBSD community is much bigger on open hardware as mm -hmm. well as, you know, if, if you know the, the open source community is if you don't have the source to it, right. it's useless. The, the BSD people are... If you don't know how your hardware works and everything about it, you know, I mean, anyway. Yeah, Broadcom support is kind of spotty. Um, older Atheros hardware, I wouldn't even try. Okay. Yeah. The, all the Intel stuff is, is really, really well supported. Okay. Um, we do not have the, like the 7260 and the 8260. They actually have Bluetooth as well. We do not have full support for Bluetooth yet. Okay. Um, that's still kind of a work in progress. Um, that was another thing I was going to say, but now I forget it. You said that you're not really running on a Raspberry Pi. You're you're using it as a terminal server, but you're also using this to do NASAs. Are the NASAs Intel based or ARM based or what? Okay, so on the NAS front, um, so FreeNAS runs primarily on uh, Intel and AMD. Mm -hmm. TrueNAS, which is basically the, the enterprise version of FreeNAS, uh, we ship Intel, AMD, and the Cadvium Thunder X ARM. Um, so TrueNAS is supported on ARM, FreeNAS is not. Um, does that? Yeah, okay. All right. A free NAS, if anybody was wondering, it's basically a network time storage. Um, it's free to download. Freenas.org. You can download it, tinker around with it, play with it, whatever. Any others? Okay. What, what is the what is the relationship between, I guess, the True OS or whatever people in OpenBSD? What is the mm. open BSD? Is I mean, there's lots of BSDs. Open right. BSD is the one I actually have some experience with. Okay. Um, although it's five years ago, but right. still, and, and I mean, I know they all developed from the same BSD original kernel, but that was centuries ago. So, <laughs> yes. Um, and I, I know, as an example, one of the reasons for the question is. The OpenBSD people are absolutely, totally, completely, incredibly proud that they have never been broken into. Mm -hmm. That their security is, I mean, you, you bring up an OpenBSD system, you know, running graphics and what have you, and it's like five generations behind in terms of, of sexy features and what have you, and they're like, we don't give a because you are never breaking into this system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I think the tagline is that 
as far as ISO goes, that there has only been one exploit found in the software they've shipped in 20 years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Um, TrueOS is based on FreeBSD, so the question would more come to what's the relationship between FreeBSD and OpenBSD. Um, so all the BSDs, it, it's different than Linux. Um, in Linux, you have different distros that are all based on the same kernel, but different user times, different or different user lands, different runtime compiles. In BSDs, they are actually separate, unique operating systems. The kernel and the user land and everything after that is different. With that being said, we share a lot of code back and forth. Um, the way it normally works is that one of the BSDs will decide to pick up the slack and work on a certain type of thing, and will develop that, and when once it's strong and stable, then all the other BSDs will go in and be like, all right, you guys have gotten that code, we're now gonna take it and use it. Um, so OpenBSD, obviously, their foray is first and foremost in security and stability and we don't want there to be any possibility of any security vulnerabilities whatsoever. Um, that's why, for instance, with Libre SSL for FreeBSD, right. we're just like, yeah, there's no point for us to try to do the work you're doing. Right. That's your wheelhouse. That's what you're best at. So we're going to let you do that, mm -hmm. and then we'll cherry pick from that as you guys develop it. Um, on the other side of the, of the spectrum, you have NetBSD. And NetBSD's idea is you should be able to run NetBSD on anything. I think right now they support 20 different architectures. Um, it's really big in Asia, and it's actually funny to see the things that they will work to install NetBSD on. Um, on the NetBSD mailing list, I believe it was a couple months ago, some guy found some random odd hardware from like the 90s that no one had ever really messed with before and worked to see if he could get it running on that because, well, why not? Not that anyone is ever gonna run it on there, but it was the challenge and the need to be faced. Um, you may have heard of the NetBSD toaster at some point. Yeah. Somebody actually installed NetBSD into a toaster because, again, <laughs> it needed to be done. Um, and you can actually SSH into the toaster and set how you want your toast done and then it'll toast according to that. Um, so NetBSD takes the forefront in um, really odd hardware and getting support from that and then of course all the other BSDs if they are interested in supporting that platform then take that code as well. FreeBSD's main point is as far as stability. So once we have a system that's up and running how can we make sure that it never crashes? So in that way the OpenBSD devs when the FreeBSD devs hammer the crap away on something will then pull that in. The biggest one that comes out to me would probably be ZFS. Um, so ZFS was originally written by Sun back in the day before they were eaten by Oracle. Right. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to stop talking about Oracle now. So, <laughs> um, it first made it to FreeBSD on the BSD side, and FreeBSD figured out all the tweaks that had to be done to make sure that it would run stably on the BSDs. Um, and then from there, OpenBSD said, okay, great, That's we want to use that file system too. Thanks for doing all the hard lifting. Now we'll just flip a few knobs, turn a few switches, and, and there we go. Um, so it, it's a give and take um, based on the area of expertise and what people are focusing on. But then essentially what you're saying is, is that TrueOS is probably similar in terms of security, but maybe a little bit further behind than the BSD side. Okay. And well, well, it's still going to be borrowing heavily on high security kernels. Yes. Um, again, since TrueOS is it's free BSD with tweaks, mm -hmm. um, we are actually the ones that are testing the security patches before they make it to just the regular FreeBSD stable and FreeBSD release. Um, so when there is a security vulnerability, it's being tested in TrueOS first before it actually then gets pushed out to the rest of FreeBSD. Most of those, um, well, I shouldn't say most, I would say probably about half of those when there are exploits that are found. Um, basically, it's kind of a team effort with the OpenBSD devs and the FreeBSD devs, from what I've heard, in fixing it so that it's not a problem. Um, there have been some exploits that actually OpenBSD, they, it doesn't work on OpenBSD, but they have found that there are certain inflection points. They're not really that useful, but they're still there. But the OpenBSD guys are still like, well, it isn't a problem, but it's related to a problem, so we're going to go ahead and fix that anyway. Um, 
So as far as security, I would say pretty much we're on the same level as FreeBSD, sometimes maybe a day ahead, which really isn't right. that important. So. Oh, there's so many people trying to write FreeBSD viruses. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so you mentioned that uh, BSD is a little bit different than Linux, where like the kernel is, aside from recompiling different flags, whatever, the same on all of them. So is more things baked into like the BSD kernel, or <clears throat> like you said, they're essentially different operating systems? Okay, it's a complex question. <laughs> so. Like I'm just trying to kind of try to understand how the like BSD philosophy of building a not distro, whatever you call it on BSD, like how, how what's the like, equivalent of like a distro on BSD, and how much is well. See, that's there. the point is because you can't really make that comparison based on what a distro is in Linux. Yeah. Because there's the kernel team in Linux that develops the kernel, uh -huh. and then you have um, the 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 GNU team that's developing basically the core user land. Yeah. And then you have different distros that are taking that kernel and that user land and the desktop that this team over here made and kind of all pulling it together and making it pretty and polishing it up and going, okay, this is a distro. Yeah. In FreeBSD, you have a table of guys that are like, okay, we need to do this to the kernel. Okay, we need to do this to LS. Okay, we need to do, and they're the ones that are actually doing the changes on the kernel and the user land and everything. It's so the same it, developers on it's that. the same developers right. that are developing the user land that are the ones developing the kernel. Okay. The kernel itself is still just a kernel. Yeah. Um, but because they're the ones with their hands in both pots, so to speak, there are some people see it as a benefit, some people see it as a weakness. Mm -hmm. The weakness is you have the same people doing everything, so some outside ideas don't come up because it's a, a smaller group of people. Whereas, for instance, in Linux, you have so many people working on so many different areas, you have a lot of people that will come up with really oddball ideas that other people in desktop might not have thought of. But when they hear it, they're like, oh, wait, hold on, that's a really good idea. We like that, but we want to go in a different direction. Um, so that's the negative side of the argument. The positive side of the argument is the people who are developing your user land are the people who also are working on the kernel. So they definitely know what they're doing. So it's not just some drive-by of some random dude who's like, eh, I want to change this about this one utility. Where you fall on the spectrum is, it's different for every person. Did that answer? Or yeah, it did. So, okay. so there's not like one BSD kernel that all the BSDs use. It's each no. project has their own. There's kernel. a FreeBSD kernel. There's a NetBSD kernel. There's an OpenBSD kernel. There's okay. a Dragonfly BSD kernel. Now there are. There's the BSD kernel in OSX. The, there's, the, there's the BSD kernel that's in OSX, um, which we will not talk about. <laughs> um, now there are releases that people put together. For instance, TrueOS is based on FreeBSD. We apply a patch set from a different branch of the BSD kernel, which is the, 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 the Linux DRM for the graphics. But it's still the FreeBSD kernel. Okay. So some people would, would call TrueOS a distro of FreeBSD. It, it really isn't, because we're using their source. Yeah. Um, we're just adding in a few binaries here and there, for instance, like the desktop and stuff like that. Uh, there also is GhostBSD, which... I think that might be based on Dragonfly or it might be based on FreeBSD, I don't know. Which is basically FreeBSD with a GUI. Um, none of the BSDs ship with a GUI, you install what you want. Um, so they're all command line out of the box. And then you just package install whatever desktop you want. Except for like GhostBSD, TrueOS, um, there's probably one or two other ones that I'm not thinking of right now. I mean, yeah, so I've been more so in the, the Linux world, like I, I get, so like you fix the security vulnerability in the kernel once and then it's kind of like every operating system kind of benefits from that after they get to whatever mm -hmm. kernel that was fixed in. So in free or in TrueOS versus like FreeBSD, well you're based on FreeBSD, so like OpenBSD. So you fix something in TrueOS, it gets put into FreeBSD. Mm -hmm. OpenBSD might not have that until whenever they figure out, oh, this is actually a problem and they need to go find it. Right. So you find that there is like huge feature differences between the BSDs? No. Okay. Um, 
other than those differences that come out of the different design philosophy of the difference in stability, portability, or security. Um, other than that, no. There's, there's not a disparity in when, for instance, there is a, a vulnerability that's fixed, how fast it gets to the other ones. Um, there is a lot of reused code between all the different BSD kernels, but they're all unique and individual and have their own ABIs. So they're not compatible with each other, but there is a ton of shared code between them. Okay. This is all making so much more sense now. <laughs> How so? Well, I just was always curious about the same things. Like, um, I just wouldn't know how to formulate that question. Like, okay. with all the different BSDs, I played with Dragonfly a little bit, but could never mm -hmm. get it working on a laptop. Imagine. Yeah. So that's where it stopped because it was like, well, if I can't really use it. <laughs> right. I've never messed with Dragonfly. Okay. Um, it's been one of those things I want to, but I just I never end up getting around to it because I'm fascinated with Hammer. Yeah. And I was fascinated with Hammer until I started getting started getting into ZFS, okay. and I'm like, yeah, this is just good enough for anything gotcha. I need. So yeah, with that, with, with it sounds like with TrueOS with a slider, I mean that's yeah even better than <laughs> what Hammer can <laughs> offer. Right. <laughs> right. When are we getting that? <laughs> Well, like I said, ZFS is already on Linux. Um, you can install it, uh, and you can install Lumina. I, I just have to check to see if um, the Life Preserver feature will work, that's what we call it, uh, will work on Linux with ZFS. I wouldn't see why that it would not work. Well, I think ZFS is weird on Linux. I don't think you It's can, behind a little bit. I don't, think, I don't think anything ships with it enabled that you can install with. No distro ships it enabled by default. Yeah. Um, but it is available. Yeah, I know it's available on Arch. I know it's available on Gentoo. Install. Canonical said they were going to ship it. Um, and then the Stalmanites went in an uproar. Um, but I, I'm so sure Canonical is still going to ship it. This off Stallman. No, yeah, well. No, no, it, no, no. They, I mean, they, what happened was people were upset that you'd be shipping code that didn't match the kernel licensing with the kernel package. So ZFS, ZFS is under the CDDL. Uh, yeah, CDDL. It's basically a BSD license, MIT right. license. It's a variation. Yeah, Stolman gets upset about that. Yeah. Um, even though Canonical will be shipping it as a module, for some reason that's not okay. Even though it's okay for a distro to ship the NVIDIA module, which is a closed source. Right. That's okay, but the... I, I don't. No, Stolman doesn't think that's okay either. Well, they don't get in an uproar as much, it seems. Um, there, there, there are those people who don't think if anything is not matching the GPL, it should not touch anything. Which I can understand to some degree, but I personally think that's a little overzealous. Um, the biggest complaint with ZFS on Linux and actually shipping it was actually not necessarily that it was a module, but it was a module that shipped in the same binary package. I, I, so they're less complaining about the fact that ZFS on Linux exists, but that they were compiling the binary against it and then shipping it in one tarball. If it was shipped separately, if you had Linux, whatever, Ubuntu, blah, and then you had Linux dash module dash ZFS dash blah, that would be less of a problem. The problem is they wanted to actually include the module in the kernel package itself. Mm. And this offended their senses. Not the fact that they were building the module, but that they were literally shipping it inside the same package. I, I, I spent about a year watching Theo and Stallman fight about the BSD license inside of the BSD, open BSD mailing list. So that was that was shortly after Stallman awarded Theo, I don't even remember what it was, but some big open source award. That was mostly for the doing the Wi-Fi stuff, mm -hmm. pioneering the open hardware and stuff. Yeah. But they're, they're two people who should not be in the same It would, it would be money. interesting to get <laughs> Linus, Theo... Um, oh, Linus is tame compared to them. RMS... All in the same room. While we're at it, why don't we just go ahead and throw pottering in there? Just to drive everybody yeah, crazy. Yeah. 
or the entire open source world just up in arms. <laughs> scare everybody away from the open source world. Everyone start installing Windows. So all of your hates in one room. Get it all out. <laughs> Well, and I have stickers. a dozen guns, there's only three bullets. Yeah. <laughs> well, very and good talk stickers. Here, Jeremy. Yeah. And I don't have many, but I do have some stickers. I know Alex Woo! loves stickers. Yes, Alex loves Yay, his stickers. stickers. And I even brought you some horns, Alex. Oh, the free BSD horns.